Hey guys, the fan of the Aussies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was actually not on purpose. That was an actual mistake. <laughs> hey guys, the fan of the Aussie here, and um, this is Jeremy. And uh, we are going to do a series of videos uh, helping people who want to reenact the era 1150 through to 1250, pretty much the plate before. The, the plate before. The time before. The era before plate monsters. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So generally, um, if you're. If you want to reenact a period or are interested in reenacting a period between 1150 and 1250, uh, you might find this bit a little bit interesting. We're just mainly doing this because when we first started and wanted to go onto YouTube to find some videos about our particular period, there were lots on Vikings, lots what? on Samurai. Lots on plate monsters with two-handed swords and pole arms, yeah. but nothing with shield and sword. Exactly, and nothing on our period. And we were thinking, this sucks. So when we sort of became a little bit more experienced and we sucked less, we yeah. decided to make this video series. So, um, we hope you guys enjoy it and uh, stay tuned. Right, so this is an arming cap. You generally wear it underneath your helmet to pad your head. Uh, they all come in uh, different uh, layers and different thicknesses. Uh, this is a nasal, you can tell uh, by the little nose plate down the middle. Uh, this particular nasal has an aventail, which is that uh, chainmail thing that comes down from the nose down to protect the neck. Uh, it's a very useful addition to have to a nasal. Uh, very good, very good breathing capacity there. Um, the trans this is the transitional. Uh, it's literally the transition between the nasal and the great helm. It has a face plate that goes around to about your ear level, but then it doesn't cover all around your face. It's um, it's quite a good helmet to use if you want a little bit of protection, but don't quite want the all-round great helm. And now this, uh, the stereotypical knight helmet is uh, the Great Helm, and it is very, very good protection. Uh, limited eyesight until you get used to it, and limited breathing until you get used to it, and that flat top uh, means that blows will go clonk on your head. Alright, so this is a coif. You generally want to wear this underneath your helmet. Uh, it's extra good neck protection. If you have an Aventail or a Fantail, you don't need it. The following video will describe a model presentation of each of these helmets. Alright, so this is a round shield. Um, this is probably the probably the most popular shield that came out in Western Europe after the Roman Empire. Uh, it's quite easy to make, um, and it makes you very mobile too, because you can run around with it really quickly. It doesn't really stop your leg movement all that much. As a result, your legs are a little bit more exposed, but um, you can get used to that very quickly, as long as you're very mobile, or, um, yeah, as long as you like that sort of... Saxony Viking type feel with a round shield, you'll definitely like this. This is a kite shield. Uh, this was um, probably used, once you get through to the 11th century, it was used a lot by pretty much most Western European and Northern European nations. Uh, it's very good protection, and as you can see, it's yeah, it pretty much protects almost your whole body. However, the only annoying bit is that it doesn't cover your head, and it's a bit heavier to lift, but that shouldn't matter too much. Alright, so this is probably the shield that outlasted the round shield and the bite shield. This is, in fact, a heater shield. It is your stereotypical knight shield. As you can tell, it's quite good protection. It doesn't quite cover your legs as much. And when you block your legs, you almost have to sort of do a teabagging motion um, to block your legs. Because if you try and turn your arm, you just turn the shield sideways. Or try and step away instead. Now, you block in a slightly different way depending on what shield you have, but the general concept is there. So, let's have a look. Alright, so when you're blocking your head, you just raise your shield up in a slightly diagonal motion. So you block your head, but you don't block your face. Because quite often you can block your vision very easily, if you don't know what you're doing. Now, a sideways strike to the body is quite easy to block. Sometimes you don't even need to move, like what Gemma's doing there. And uh, for the legs, with the round shield, the beautiful thing is that if you turn your arm sideways, the round shield stays the same shape. Um, that is probably the only annoying thing you have to watch with the round shield, is how you have to block your legs. And stabs are pretty easy to block. You can either just block statically or push it away, as Jim did. Now, blocking on the other side is pretty much uh, the same deal. Uh, a block to the body, you can generally just not move, or you can turn your shield to face it. Jim didn't move, and that's fine too. Uh, blocking your leg, the exact same movement. You just bring the shield to statically block the sword on the other side. Here's the head block in a little more detail.
Now, blocking with the heater shield to the head is pretty much the same as the round shield. Diagonal motion, so you block your head but can still see uh, your opponent in case they do a tricky, tricky hit. Uh, blocking to the body is pretty much the same. You can either move your shield to meet it, or you can just keep it there and not move it at all, as Gem did. Both are okay. Now, for legs, you can either do what we call the medieval tea bag, or you can do the opposite, which is step away. Either you can do. It's just with the heater shield, you will have to watch your legs, just like the round shield. Now, the other side, um, same with the round shield, pretty much the same. Uh, this time, Gem moved the shield a little bit more. Uh, you can keep it still, depending on how wide your heater shield is. Blocking your legs is pretty much the same there. You can do the medieval teabag and block, or you can step back. Either way, both is okay. Now the kite's protection value is great because when you verse people, sometimes they just do as follows. However, you will get the odd guy who will come against you and just repeatedly try and hit you in the head so your arm gets tired from having to lift your shield all the time because the kite shield tends to be a little bit heavier than the other two types of shields. Now, uh, when you're blocking your head, uh, try and do the same. Lift it in a slightly diagonal motion. Yes, it will be tiring. Good arm exercise. Um, now, this is the best bit. When it goes for the body, you literally almost don't have to move. When you block your leg, you simply turn your shield to face the weapon. Blocking on the other side is practically the same thing. Barely have to move, or you can move it a little bit. Um, either way is okay. Um, and also blocking your legs, just move it slightly because the point of the shield is a little bit thin. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed that. If you're new and you're planning to do this this kind of period, um, I really hope this has sort of been helpful. The next episode will all be about um, offensive things, so weapons and how to swing properly in a reenacting way so you can swing properly and it's a good swing. It's a good attack, but it's a safe attack. There are safe attacks, believe it or not. If you could uh, click that like button at the bottom, that'd be great. Or if you could subscribe, I or me and Jen would like you even more. And uh, stay tuned uh, for the rest of the series. All right, catch you guys later. Now it's recording. Now whether your head will fit in that will be exciting. <laughs> that won't actually sit on my shoulders more than my head. Let's just get probably from here up. Yep. Okay, that's my artistic license there. <laughs>